Hi everyone and welcome to my Lightning Arrow Dead Eye Guide. So this is my leak starter for patch 3.17 Arc Nemesis leak. I've played it for around a week now and I have completed the entire atlas on a pretty small budget. I think I had like maybe 2x invested or so by the time I did that. And I had also done most of these Maven's invitations minus the feared at that point, including Maven herself. So the only thing that I couldn't do at that point was the feared, but I did that later after I had invested more into the character because I really liked the build. I invested more, I went with yeah, around 25 exalts or so in the end, and half of that is actually spent on pretty big quality of life improvements that you don't actually need in my opinion. So you can definitely make this build work in the end game quite well, and it annihilates bosses with the right setup. So there are some little details that are quite important to boost the single target DPS. But as you can see, I'm annihilating Cortex in like three seconds. I have done the Fear Deathless. I have done pretty much every boss you can think of. And it is definitely a breeze. And for mapping, obviously, this is a bow character. This is gonna be blasting. As a Dead Eye, you are fast as hell. And mapping is the true domain of such a character. So I ended up at level 97 with this character. Towards the end, I was doing pretty juiced up tier 16 maps with Beyond, with some leap mechanics on there, Abyss stuff everywhere, and even with Delirium here and there. And I actually went completely deathless from 96 to 97 after I had made some final tweaks to the build and the passive tree, and I was. Not exactly super tanky, but it was fine, it was manageable even against the hardest maps in the game almost. So overall it is working pretty great and I had a lot of people coming in on the stream asking me about the build and how to optimize it, what to do and all these things. So I wanted to make a full guide. First of all I want to give a shout out to Havoc who made the original tree. So he had done quite a bit of testing and uh, some experimentation and he made something very similar to this here and I just took that and took this as my baseline because I started a league late and um, I was just trying to find a build that was like an arrow build. I wanted to play Lightning Arrow. It was the first time for me actually playing Lightning Arrow and I went with this and then tweaked it from there and finally made the whole character. His is more optimized for SSF. You can definitely play this build in SSF quite well because there's only two uniques in this whole setup which is the Azanas Chant and the Omniscience. And Omniscience is not exactly required, but I put this in the build quite late and it was a massive DPS improvement and has also the advantage that you get a lot of mental rest. So this was really nice, but Azanas Chant is really the true kicker here and it is apparently target farmable. So there's a divination card that drops in Dooms and Dry Sea, so you can just farm it up and actually have that in SSF as well with a little bit of time investment. Aside from this, all the gear is just basic yellow items with a bunch of good stats. I don't think I have anything influenced. I just took like good items. Mostly I stacked um, crit, crit multi, spell suppression. I stacked a lot and otherwise it's lots of life, res, attributes. Nothing particularly exciting. And we have a triple alley bow. You can also go with double alley and something like another good prefix, like a big elemental leadership attacks roll or elemental penetration roll even. So there are also these options with a bit less DPS, but you have other good stats. But yeah, this is how the gear looks. I guess the big thing that you can't get in SSF so easily is the Lion Eyes Fall, which you can put here in the steward slot and then get the dagger and the claw notes, which are kind of nice. But this is also not really a requirement for the build. You see when you have the starter endgame tree, I don't have that at all. And we have like more stuff down here that kind of makes up for it. This gives you a bit more DPS overall, but you have a bit less defenses, you have a bit less speed. And it's just a bit of like a trade-off. But overall, I like to have the big, bigger DPS here at the end. I also have a bunch of leveling trees down here. So in case you want to level this build, it is a very smooth experience. I was destroying the campaign with this and even the early maps with no gear was quite a breeze. And then later on towards the red maps in T60 maps, you can be quite squishy, especially if you don't kill stuff really fast, but it does definitely work well on even SSF. I'm going to show you here mostly the starter end game tree and what you want to pick up. So you start here on the ranger area and you path down immediately to the precise technique. So this is something that you want to do at least for the campaign and uh, get 40% more attack damage if accuracy rating is higher than maximum life. So this can be rather easily done by picking up this uh, wheel here as well. This gets accuracy and then running a precision order. 
but keep an eye on your accuracy and your maximum life to make sure you actually have this effect while you level because it might switch here and there. But typically, it didn't need much investment. And then after the campaign, you can drop this. But for the campaign, this is a nice boost. And aside from this, you want to pick up you know, some life here. You pick up some of these like bow nodes everywhere and a lot of spell suppression. So you see, we have spell suppression here. We have spell suppression here. And we also have spell suppression here. So you want to hit 100%. And if you don't have good gear, you have to get it from the tree. But there's also a bit of a payoff, which is the spell suppression mastery. So for one point, you get something like 6, 7, 8% DPS or so. This is quite nice. Then there is a bunch of good stuff down here. So I took Graceful Assault, which has increased armor and evasion, which we stack both with the Grace and the Determination Aura, and potentially from Flask and Gear. And you have the uh, Onslaught proc there. So this was something to pick up very early as well. And here's also other stuff like Blind. So this is something you pick up in the end game. Blinding enemies helps a lot to actually improve your critical strike chance and helps you to survive as well. And you also have extra crit there. And you also have the mark wheel here with culling strike and with frenzy charge generation. So this can be dropped later. So this is actually what I did, for example, with the lion eyes tree. So we had a culling strike from the dagger mastery. And we also have the frenzy charge generation from the quiver. So this is one of the veiled, un, uh, unveiled crafts that you can get from betrayal. And you can put it on any quiver. And then you don't need this uh, wheel anymore. But until then, this is quite, quite nice. Obviously, point blank is very important. So there's also something you want to pick up very early. So precise technique, point blank. This essentially carries you. Make sure you stand close to enemies when you do this. So essentially, most of your Dino Target Nuke will be done exactly in front of the enemy because of point blank and because of the barrage spread. Because when you shoot, your barrage protectors will spread out, and if you have like a rather small target, you will not hit them with all the arrows. So this is why you want to have um, a close range. So you basically, if Kirak is the enemy here, you just want to like stand like this, gives it the most DPS, and the same for the totems. So you have a barrage set up with your totems, and they will also blast into the target with basically the, the same modifiers. Aside from this, there's one other important cluster of passes, which is the mana reservation, which is right here at the range of start. So you want to pick up Charisma, you want to get the Mana Reservation here, and you also want to get some Flash Charges. So like this, you get Life and Mana Flash Charges, and you can even take a Flash Mastery. And Mental Ailment Removal is quite nice. You can get rid of uh, the Freeze, you can get rid of Ignite. So this is very useful to have. And uh, I dropped this in the end game because I had Flash Charges from my Forbidden Flash and Forbidden Flame which gave me the Pathfinder flasks. But these are rather expensive and not necessarily worth it when you don't want to invest very much into the build. So you can just keep this wheel here and it's quite nice anyway. And obviously, finally, we path up here to the um, shadow area a little bit. So there's the life leech, mana leech. This helps you out a little bit, but it's not enough. You still need to run with a mana flask. So I have an enduring mana flask here. Flask effect is not removed at full mana. And even so, even with the leech, and even a bit of life um, mana on hit, it was still kind of sketchy. So I even invested a little bit into non shining skills have minus mana cost. This is not required, but I did notice that when I shoot like this, even by leeching, even with the flask up, I would sometimes shoot normal arrows. So you see, especially once Asana's chance keeps proccing, you will see that there's sometimes normal arrows here. If you look closely, instead of the blue arrows, I have these gray ones. This means I don't have enough mana. So this can happen. So I need to invest quite a little bit into mana there. And this is the way to solve it. And finally, there's Ghost Dance. So you want to have a little bit of energy shield, something like 400 to 800 or so is nice. As long as you have enough evasion rating, something like 15 to 25k or so is a good value. And then when you get hit, you will recover energy shield immediately. And this allows you to uh, survive more easily, especially when you get comboed from multiple monsters at once. One last thing about the masteries on a tree. So there's also these elemental wheels here. They're not necessarily acquired. I actually dropped both of them in the end game here because I, they simply didn't give me enough DPS anymore. They're like 2.8% per point there. And here I actually repathed a little bit because I took this uh, Shadow Life here to get more life in the end. But um, for the start, this is actually pretty good because you don't have that much additive damage. And there's also pretty good masteries. So there's the um, exposure. So you are doing a lot of cold and lighting damage anyway. 
and we have Hydrosphere in the build. Hydrosphere gives 10% exposure to cold and lightning, that it's 18, so it's pretty massive DPS improvement, especially if we don't have Omniscience yet, so this can be pretty nice. But there's also another mastery, which is the Reflect Mastery, so you can take this, and together with the Soul of Yugul, you will become Reflect Immune, as long as you don't have any increased damage taken debuffs on you, like Shock. So if you are shocked, you can actually kill yourself to reflect still, but this has basically never happened to me. And this will essentially allow you to run any map mod. You don't have to worry about corrupting your maps. And you have you know, no troubles with cannot leech because you have to flask anyway. You have no troubles with reflect. So nothing really to worry about. As long as you can run something like elemental weakness and you're a little bit overcapped on your resistances. But aside from this, there's also this uh, effect of non-damaging ailments that's pretty nice. There's also the elemental resistances you can pick up if you want. So there's actually pretty good stuff here to kind of like help you out. I like to run with this one, but when I was still like mapping, like corrupted maps all the time and stuff, I really enjoyed the elemental reflect immunity. So now for my skill setup. So first of all, my main link, this is the lightning arrow that I use for clearing and also for single target with a gem swap. So there's a lightning arrow, there is the element types of attacks, there's Trinity, extremely powerful support, but you have to make sure that it works. So you can actually watch the effect of Trinity when you go and uh, hit some enemies, and you get like this little icon on your buff bar at the top. I'm gonna show this real quick. You have to make sure that you kind of balance out your elements. And you see here in the top left, this is the Trinity support, and this is what it should look like. You want to have all three elements active, so you want to hit something, and get this effect. It doesn't have to be on the first attack necessarily, but you want to get all three of them, like, you know, basically permanently up if you are constantly attacking. So one thing to really watch out for is that you have a kind of like a range of elemental damage that makes it so that Trinity can proc. So if you look at my lightning arrow right now, we have uh, lightning damage 600 to 8600. So this is a really high range. And the good part is that it's quite easy to proc Trinity support because of this super high range of lighting damage. But you need to have at least one of the other elements somewhere in the middle of that, like this fire damage here. You see this is 1600 to 3000, so this kind of fits right into the middle of this lighting damage. And then you get sometimes more fire damage than lighting damage, and sometimes more lighting damage than fire damage, and this will allow Trinity to work. If you don't have this multi-element combo, you cannot run Trinity but it is extremely powerful and you want to make sure you have that. Even with all the extra elemental penetration I already have from the Omniscience Amulet, this support chain gives me 47% DPS. It's actually pretty nuts. Then there's crit strikes, crit damage. So I dropped crit strikes in the end because I had enough crit chance towards the end, but I was running this for the longest time. So the double crit gems is quite nice. And uh, then there's uh, Mirage, Archer and Barrage support. So this is for single target and for uh, AoE, I have Chain. Chain is extremely nice. You already get plus one from the Ascendancy. So you have this, and then you have two more chains. So you have three chains, and they can also chain back from walls. So like this, you will annihilate AoE clearing. And I was even destroying the Conquerors with this. I even did like one of the Elder Slayer invitations with Chain accidentally because I forgot to sort the Barrage. So the damage is not exactly terrible. I only really used Barrage towards the end for like the Fiat, the Maven, Sterus, and these kind of things. And for everything else, I just stuck with the chain. But the Barrage support does help you out on single target DPS. And you have even more damage on just the Annihilate bosses. I was actually not running Mirage Archer for a long time. So this is how I had this triple blue gem combo here. So this is kind of up to you if you like the Mirage Archer or not. I put it in there towards the end because I didn't need to crit strikes anymore. And then I had to run Mirage Archer just kind of helping me out of some extra DPS, getting rid of some monsters that run on me sometimes when I click on Arc Nemesis monsters and, you know, choose something from the inventory, these kind of things. Now here's the second six link. This is the Ballista setup. So I use this for extra DPS for, for example, Arc Nemesis or when there's like a ritual or on the boss fights. So they don't actually do most of the damage. Most of it still comes from your own hits with barrage support on the big bosses. But they do help out, they do blast some stuff around you, and there are multiple ways to do this. So you can run Focused Ballista, which makes it so that they only shoot when you shoot, and they shoot towards the target that you aim. 
but I actually didn't like this very much. I think this makes much more sense with something like Toxic Rain, but not so much here because I enjoy that the totems actually shoot at random targets because again, similarly, when you're mapping, you have like random enemies in all directions and sometimes you just want the totems to clear them up while you are, you know, pressing your interfaces against Betrayal or Archnemesis or while I'm setting up some expedition encounter. I was, I was farming a lot of expedition, for example. So it's nice to just put the totems and then let them like deal with the remaining enemies and not really worry about shooting yourself. So the setup was Lightning Arrow, Ballista Totem, multiple totems. Like this, you have five totems. There's Barrage Support again. And then again, we have the Crit Damage and the Crit Strikes, or you have uh, Elemental Damage of Attacks, or for example, I also have Elemental Focus here. In the end, Elemental Damage of Attacks would actually be the, the same, I believe. So yeah, this is actually the same damage. But for me, I didn't bother coloring this to like triple red. I just got this quite early when I colored it. Yeah, but for me, this was an evasion energy chest. I colored this a little bit and then I went with this setup here and I was totally fine. And the big elemental ailments come from your own attacks anyway. The totems have rather low damage. Now for the supporting skills. So I mentioned the auras already. There's determination, there's grace. So these are our defensive layers here. So we have um, a decent amount of uh, evasion rating. We have a decent amount of armor when the flasks are up. And uh, you can definitely invest more into both of these if you get like better bases. Like I didn't really have like the perfect rolls here on some of these items, but you can definitely get a bit more tanky, especially with more armor, I would say. This would help you out. But yeah, we have this buffed with the Defiance Banner. And then we use Molten Shell. Molten Shell is extremely powerful, so use Molten Shell to protect yourself. You see this absorbs like 2.1k uh, damage, just like that. It has a very fast cooldown, so you can basically stay protected for like half the time or so. And when I pop my Granite Flask, my Molten Shell goes up to 4,500. And this is without really big investment on any armor gear. I only have boots with the armor, the rest comes from the flask and the auras. And then there's also the Val Molten Shell, which lasts a lot longer. So this has a buff duration of 10.8 seconds and gives you even more absorb, but doesn't absorb that much per hit. But this is very useful when you have boss fights, when you have metamorphs, when you have legion. So you just pop this and you are well protected, but you have to make sure that you stay a bit away and stay mobile when Molten Shell is down against the dangerous targets. So when you're mapping and there's like an you know, Arc Nemesis, there's expedition monsters running at you. You can definitely get combo to death quite easily without Molten Shell, but once it's up, and this is like at least half the time, you are fine. So usually you have like very quick nuke phases and you will just destroy everything during this Molten Shell and then you're fine. I also have Dash in here. I like Dash, so you can change this to another movement skill if you like, especially uh, Blink Arrow would probably be a go-to choice here. You can also go Flame Dash if you'd like to have this um, safe traveling because dash doesn't protect you against damage so you can dash through ground effects or through a serious beam and you actually take damage with flame dash you can go through and you don't take damage so there might be a kind of um, an argument to change this but for me this was not really any issue i just did everything with dash and it was fine i have a lot of movement speed as a dead eye with tailwind and all that onslaught so i was just fine like dashing around a little bit and didn't really have a second or a different uh, mobility skill here. And finally, here's the SNS chant setup. So this is Tornado, Hydrosphere, Power Charge on Crit, and I also added the Frost Bomb, which is very nice against anything Maven related. I did a lot of bossing with this character, so having the 75% reduced life regeneration rate is very useful, also against certain Arc Nemesis monsters, for example. So I added this. But if you do this without SNS chant or you don't have it yet, then you probably don't do the Frost Bomb unless you do some of these maybe encounters. So you just swap the Hydro for the Frost Bomb and otherwise you have increased duration in there. The biggest part here is the Tornado. So you can hit the Tornado just like an enemy and you will produce the area of effect explosion from Lightning Arrow on the Tornado and on the boss at the same time. So that you essentially deal double damage against single target just from this part alone. The Hydrosphere was nerfed. So this was also used as an extra target in the past but this doesn't work anymore. It has a cooldown now, but Tornado, you can still blast into it and it will deal damage twice. So this is extremely useful. And this is also the main reason why SNS Chant is so powerful for this build, because you just constantly trigger 
the tornado on top of the target. You see it keeps spawning over and over. And you also have the exposure from the hydrosphere. I also get the life regeneration reduction from the frost bomb. It's all in there all at once. And it is extremely nice and smooth. And this is why this helm is so good. You can do this manually. So what you would do is you drop the frost bomb and then you have increased duration in there as a red link. And then you just have tornado and hydrosphere that are cast manually. So the combo to do this then on a the single target is you set up the totems, you do the hydrosphere, you do the tornado, and then you blast for like a few seconds. And then you basically do the same combo again, hydrosphere, tornado, blast again a few seconds. And at that point, the totems will disappear and you have to set everything up again. So this is how I played at the start without SNS chant. And then I had this and it was so, so much more smooth, so much more DPS on bosses. So extremely nice. I would definitely not go without this. Keep in mind that you can't actually spawn a tornado very far away from you. So this is another reason to stand close to the enemy. You see the hydrosphere spawns way up there, but the tornado spawns right in front of me. And you have to make sure that you stand close on enemy, else you don't get this double hit effect, and you don't get your point blank, and you don't get you know, the barrage projectiles hit because they spread out. So when you're far away from the tank, you deal no damage, and when you are close up, you blast them down. Then we have the sniper's mark, extremely powerful skill. So that alone also gives something like 50% DPS almost. So completely nuts how strong it is and it also makes these uh, projectiles like spread out in all directions so this even helps you for AOE clear a little bit and uh, in some cases for like some of the boss fights with Maven and there's multiple boss fights you hit most, most of them at the same time so very nice with mark on hit you don't have to worry about it you just have to make sure that you have enough mana to actually trigger it so this is actually the most costly skill you're going to have in your setup at uh, 66 mana cost at level 20 so you might have to make sure that you can actually cast this but this is actually not such a big problem at the higher levels i have 110 mana unreserved right now you want to make sure that you have probably a little bit more than the 66 mana because you also want to keep shooting when it procs it procs every four seconds uh, for some of the end game bosses i did remove mark on hit for example for maven or sirius or something because you get slightly more mark effect and for example if you have a white socket you could even swap in like a flame dash or so to um, make those boss fights a bit easier. And finally, the position. So I have a level 20 position here and I took one accuracy wheel, but this is something for you to kind of like min-max on your own character because I have zero accuracy rolls on my gear. And you see, I have 100% hit chance here. So this is uh, very nice in the game. I have slightly less, I think I have 97 here and 88 against the evasive monsters. This is with no accuracy on the gear and no accuracy from dexterity because I have Omniscience, which removes all my dexterity basically, and it still works with level 20 position and this one wheel here. And I have the position as mana reservation efficiency mastery. This solved all the accuracy issues and I can just recommend the same, but if you get an item that has like a big accuracy roll, like a 500 roll somewhere, you can definitely run with a low level position. So this is kind of something for you to min max on your own and you might have a lot more mana available if you run a lower than 20 position. In case you are wondering, the bandits I have is two passive points. I did run with Alira early on, so this is very nice, especially for leveling and for early campaign and early maps and stuff, because you get resists, you also have to crit multi there for free, you have some mana region that helps you out, so kind of nice, but later on I respect the two points. And for my Pantheon, I usually ran with Soul Solaris, because this is very good against uh, bosses, because of this additional physical damage reduction take no uh, extra crit damage and uh, elemental ailment avoidance. You are not elemental ailment immune here, so you gotta be careful with that. And you have to, for example, press the mana flask to remove freeze. So when you press strong boxes, you want to press this, or sometimes you have like, you know, some freeze coming at you from the cold damage. So you gotta be a bit quick with this, but typically not a big deal. There were some situations where I wanted to switch my Pantheon, but I realized I hadn't uh, like leveled any of them. So I just stuck with Solaris. And for the minor one, I had Soul of Yugul almost all, in, all the time because of the reduced effect of curses. I combined this with reduced effect of curses on a Quicksilver. So I had like minus 85 or minus 90% reduced effect of curses. So this makes any mapping extremely smooth. Elemental Reflect Immunity, curses, whatever. Kind of Leech, doesn't matter. So this was very nice, and sometimes I reused this Soul of Garakhan for the reduced effect of shock. 
But in the end, this is up to you. You can like definitely swap out some other things. For example, Shakari could be quite nice. I had absolutely no Chaos Rest, which is kind of like a mistake here. You see I have way too much resistances and no Chaos Rest. This comes mostly from the Omniscience because I put this into my build extremely late and I didn't want to replace all my items again. So I just kind of like left it there. I was like, okay, I have way too much rest now, whatever. Realistically, I would like to get to at least something like maybe zero Chaos Rest or so. So this would have been nice to so just get like two Chaos Rest rolls somewhere instead of some of the Ellie rolls. And then this would have been even more smooth because the degens do hurt a lot and you have to react quite quickly sometimes with your flasks to actually survive. Water flasks. So I had um, the life and a mana flask all the way. So here's Karatum Blood Immunity. Here's the Freeze Immunity. This is Enduring Mana Flask, so it doesn't get removed at full mana, which is very nice. Here's Instant Recovery on low life. Very useful. So I would definitely recommend to go with uh, the Startled or the Panicked uh, Life Flasks here. And then we have Granite Quicksilver. I would not swap this out at any point. The only place where I removed the Quicksilver was in Simulacrum because you don't really need movement speed. I had a phasing flask there so I can actually move through enemies at any time. But typically I was fine with phasing on a jewel. So this is how my jewel looks with phasing and blind. So I would recommend to get something similar or just uh, spread it out to do the two different jewels if you want to get both effects. And I had a Dying Sun for the extra two projectiles for the extra DPS. So this was quite nice. One last thing I want to highlight is also my Anoint. So this is Vengeance Cascade, which is something that you can get only from Anoints, which is here on the uh, outside the Ranger area. And this has attack projectiles returned to you from final target and pierce all targets when they return. This is extremely nuts. So once I put this in, I felt a significant improvement in my DPS because, um, well, it's hard to see, but you see that some of these arrows just kind of go backwards through me. You see they fly to the right. And essentially, they can hit the target again. And also, sometimes when you shoot into a wall, you have this chaining effect from uh, Deadeye. So they come back to you and they can hit the target again. So Vengeance Cascade, it is quite costly. It needs two golden oils, but extremely powerful. So once you want to invest a little bit into Amulet, I would recommend this one. Completely crazy. For a more budget option, I can recommend the True Strike. So this costs like a black and a crimson or something. So basically nothing, like two or three chaos, and you can just throw it on like any amulet you're wearing until you have like an endgame amulet and you wanna, you know, throw on the golden oils there. I would definitely not go without this. This was extremely powerful. This was the first time I tried Vengeance Cascade. I was always very curious about it, but you can really feel the impact once you have this Vengeance Cascade. So you just have like extra hits on the target. So you have the tornado, the boss hit, that's two hits already, and sometimes the arrows come back and they hit them again for three hits. And this is also how we annihilate signal target so much sometimes. And that's also about it for my character overview. So as I said, the total cost is something like 25x. Half of that was the Forbidden Flash, Forbidden Flame, and my Watcher's Eye. And all of these I would not consider required. So this is yeah, some speed, some reduced damage taken. The Pathfinder Flasks are not exactly required. They make lab mapping a bit more smooth, they make bossing a bit more smooth. But at my DPS values, I didn't even need those flasks on the bosses that much anymore. But I really enjoyed having the flask charges. But there's, you know, other tools to get more flask charges, like those wheels here. There's the flask mastery, there's the flasks. You can even pick up uh, this flask stuff here at the bottom. So there's definitely options. And aside from this, you know, the bow was like seven exalts. The chest was three exalts. So these are like the two big items here. And everything else was in between somewhere like 30 to maybe 150C per item. So nothing extremely crazy here. You can definitely improve a lot of these. So I could get like some big influence items here and there, or I could put on even better rolls or even better implicits with the Eldritch currency. But I was quite happy with the stuff. I just used like the smallest tier for basically all of these. Here's Intimidate, there's extra spell suppression, here's action speed, quite nice. Here's increased effect of auras, quite nice. You can even do something like um, Endurance Charge Generation. So this would be something to look into. There is a way to um, get Endurance Charges from the chest as an Implicit. And then you can get some Endurance Charge Duration from uh, Implicits on your Jewels, for example. And this way you could have permanent free Endurance Charges would be very useful for mapping at least. So there is definitely some options there. But overall, I'm extremely happy with how the build turned out. 
how I'm deleting bosses with it, with it and I had a blast. So I hope that you enjoyed this video and it helps you out if you want to blast this on lightning area yourself. I heard from some people that are complaining about low single target damage but if you have the right setup with the mark, with the tornado, hydrosphere, I also had these focus crafts here for a chance to deal double damage and the crit chance is lucky and then you combine this with you know a nuke phase during molten shell you can annihilate these single targets quite easily with the right combo. So you just have to make sure that you play this properly and for mapping for AOE this is absolute breeze. It's a bow build. You have chain in there that you destroy anyway. So this is how the build works. Hope you liked this video. Let me know if you have any questions or any comments or how that went for you. So you can definitely go much crazier with all of this if you invest more but I will stop with this character at this point and hope that you will have a blast. So hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you guys next time.